All right. Um, welcome to the paper four historical linguistics uh, lecture series. What I'm trying to do uh, this term is to combine the questions of the social linguistic second half of uh, the paper, so approaches to language purism, forms of address, with some historical uh, backdrop. And I've um, also invited a number of guest speakers. So the first two weeks where I'm going to lecture are basically an introductory uh, section for the more specific uh, later um, lectures. So today I'm going to look at um, approaches to etymology and the history of words. So what constitutes the whole dictionary of uh, German, how it has it changed through uh, the centuries, um, what is the political agenda also behind the concept of Deutsch. And um, next week I'm looking at dialects, particularly looking at Middle Low German because I'm working on a project to edit uh, the letters of 15th century nuns who wrote uh, in a mix of their local dialect, um, so the Low German of Lüneburg area with a language uh, they had learned at school, namely Latin, and how they construct it gives you an interesting setup then about later discussions of uh, pure German language without lo alone words and um, uh, dialects. And then we'll have a, a very fun uh, double session on swearing and cursing as a form, specific form of address. I was uh, in December in Halle University where Andrea Seidel um, had uh, put up a big exhibition in the university library about uh, the history of swearing and the history of what are taboo words, how you can uh, insult people effectively gives a really interesting cultural history um, so, Geraldine Horan from UCL will be here in person to deliver the lecture. We'll then um, give the recorded lecture to Andrea and uh, record with her uh, a trialogue about um, the um, backstory of the swearing, which I'll uh, upload uh, afterwards. In week seven, uh, we'll have another lecture on dialects going even a bit further west than Middle Low German, namely towards west uh, to um, Old Frisian, which is uh, the kind of missing link between English and German. Um, some of you might know Johanneke Sitzma, who is... Um, our lecturer in uh, linguistics and also a librarian at the Taylorian, and she's running the old Frisian summer school. So she is running it as a kind of uh, taster session of how to define what is a German as a language, what is a German dialect, because this can be quite a political question, how you divide up uh, dialects. And then we'll have a very exciting double bill on etymology, uh, something I've been intending to do for a long time. Uh, as you know, just round the corner on Walton Street is uh, the largest dictionary project in the world, the Oxford English uh, Dictionary, and they have three full-time etymologists on staff. Uh, um, and uh, two of them working on actually uh, Germanic words in English. 
So uh, Philip Durkin, uh, who has written the key textbooks on um, German loanwords in English, will be in dialogue with Aletta Leipold, uh, who comes from the Althochdeutsches Wörterbuch in Leipzig, and um, will talk about a cultural history of words for writing, uh, starting with runa for runes rizan, which is the word that is linked to English write, and uh, skriban, and what uh, the use tells us about also the cultural um, history. And um, Philip will complement that with the uh, English side. Uh, so I've roughly mapped it onto the topics of the essays for paper uh, four, but won't follow kind of the chronology uh, necessarily, but more have an internal system of reference. And in this system of reference, I'm going to start with a framework, um, the broadest framework for German, namely the Indo-European uh, family of languages. Uh, any idea what these uh, blank areas are? Uh, the non-Indo-European languages within uh, the uh, within Europe. Yeah, Finnish um, and Hungarian, uh, they form a curious uh, uh, link. And you can see how in the migration period, uh, the Indo-European languages uh, parted them to the two edges of Europe, to the far north and uh, to this island um, in, in Hungary, and here in uh, Spain, Basque. Basque exactly is um, the uh, pre-Indo-European uh, language, again uh, pushed to the borders of uh, the language continuum. And uh, what you can do is, when looking at words that survive from all Indo-European languages, is that you can do a kind of linguistic archaeology. Because words that exist in Sanskrit, as well as in Latin, as well as in German, must have existed also as an uh, object or concept at that period. Uh, so, some fun facts are that the word for mouse is shared across the whole um, area, but the word for cats isn't. So, um, it took uh, a long time before uh, the challenge of having mice was answered. Uh, so, uh, uh, having different words for uh, the animal that is a cat tells you that uh, they were tamed later than dogs because uh, dogs uh, have the same um, word. Not the word dog, but the word hound, uh, hund, carno, uh, um, is in uh, Latin, is uh, shared. Um, of the, uh, and it also helps you, uh, you, you can do a kind of genealogy of words by having, looking at the offspring of these words in the modern languages, you can, can try to uh, work out the original concept behind it. So uh, looking at the word for fee, uh, so cattle, um, in German and compare it with the Latin pecus um, and the English word fee uh, tells you that uh, the currency was in cattle. 
So you would pay by exchanging, bartering uh, your uh, livestock rather than by uh, using coins. Um, so the word pecuniary uh, related to Latin pecus uh, leads to the English meaning fee while the uh, other meaning of Latin pecus as cattle leads then to the German uh, fee. And they look completely different, but if you apply a kind of, uh, um, kind of uh, back engineering the consonant shifts through back from the second consonant shift back uh, uh, through the first consonant shift, you arrive at this reconstructed um, original word. It's using language, a kind of DNA test for language by finding related, uh, distant uh, relations. Um, and uh, so another interesting example in which different directions um, the same word can develop is the word gust, um, which develops... Um, which comes into English twice. So it comes directly um, from Indo-European and arrives as the word guest. Uh, but uh, it also is later via French, the Anglo-Norman, borrowed again from the Latin source. Um, and uh, so the word host and guest are essentially the same, um, just uh, imported into the language at uh, different periods in, in time. And, uh, typically, the Indo-European words that you have are these basic concepts, like talking about family. Uh, so uh, the importance of uh, having uh, the words for father, mother, sister, brother, all to this uh, core vocab. And you see it's an a agricultural society, so any words for um, uh, uh, special buildings will be not Indo-European, but uh, later developments uh, derived from the earlier. And, um, the key point to remember also for verbs is that all strong verbs, namely all verbs that have an uplaut, so a different vowel in the past tense from the present tense, um, are shared across the Indo-European uh, languages. And um, it, it's quite fun uh, checking uh, for concepts behind these um, strong verbs. So you have um, zingen uh, as a kind of Indo-European context. Uh, you might remember uh, Brecht's song, uh, 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 Brecht's poem about uh, gab es Gesang in den uh, dunklen Zeiten. Ja, sie, sie haben auch gesungen. So uh, we have to um, uh, assume that there was singing in Indo-European times because the word also to sing has kept this meaning across all the languages. It hasn't, um, isn't pointing back to a different concept behind singing in earlier times. While the word sagen, uh, uh, ich sagte, gesagt, is a weak verb. So you have uh, uh, something that is um, to tell in plain words is, uh, is later than to tell it uh, through a song. Mm, uh, interesting also, reiten uh, in Indo-European verbs, so that links back to there was a concept of taming um, animals that uh, is the same word across uh, all the Indo-European 
languages, while then will come later to uh, specialized forms of writing, they are later. Um, so, for example, um, you can only galop if you have stirrups uh, to keep you in the saddle. So, galopieren is a more modern word, while the basic reiten is an old um, word. All um, modal verbs, auxiliary verbs, are also shared across the Indo-European spectrum. Um, and it's an interesting uh, uh, experiment to uh, compare the words for the weekdays across the Indo-European languages, because the concept of a seven-day week is also shared across the Indo-European um, continuum. Uh, but uh, most of the names for the weekdays aren't direct loan word, uh, not directly shared, but rather adapted from uh, the uh, Latin um, language and then Christianized or Germanized um, in, in German. So you have um, the concept of Sunday uh, in Latin solis dies, so the day of the god Sol, who is also uh, the uh, highest um, god um, of the universe, and that uh, you have a, a, tra a lone translation translating Sol as Zuna and uh, Dies as uh, Tag, similar with Lune, Dies, you have it as Mond, Tag, uh, becoming Monday. Um, with a Martis Dies, uh, so the day of the god Mars, the god of war, you have it um, uh, domesticated into the Germanic dialects by replacing Mars with uh, Germanic uh, gods. Um, so, Tsiu, um, or uh, is one of the Germanic gods of war. Similarly, um, for Mercury, uh, who survives in the French um, Mer Mercredi, you have um, Wodan uh, coming in. So Wednesday as Wodan's day, um, the same uh, God in the God's uh, hi uh, divine hierarchy, but um, uh, and um, the word Mittwoch then develops as a euphemism because uh, uh, the German missionaries didn't want to invoke uh, Wodan, so they just called it middle of the week uh, Mittwoch. So you have uh, different ways of um, importing from other languages, either by taking Fremdwörter uh, to uh, directly um, follow it with, and Samstag is an interesting case for that, that has wandered through different um, language groups. So it starts as Sabbat, Sabbath, in the Semitic languages. Um, then it became uh, in the um, Jewish diaspora. Diaspora, it becomes uh, Sambaton, and uh, through this Greek uh, version, um, it's uh, imported uh, as Sambastag, and then becomes Samstag. Um, and is uh, then replaced in some regions in Germany by Sonnabend, uh, referring, relating it to the Christian 
uh, Sonntag. So you have in the week a mix of uh, loan translations and uh, loan words. And then we come to the kind of second layer of, uh, from Indo-European narrowing down to uh, Germanic languages. And uh, just last year, um, there was a very exciting find, this rune stone um, where the, uh, was found in Norway in a graveyard which could be dated by um, radio uh, carbon dating of the bones in the grave as within the first couple of centuries AD, uh, which is 400 years earlier than uh, uh, the earliest runes had been known before that. So uh, until then only runic inscriptions from the 6th century were known. So uh, the common conception was that uh, really the first written Germanic dialect was Gothic, um, the East Germanic uh, language. You see here an example on, um, on the top uh, right-hand side of the beautiful uh, silver codex written with silver ink on purple uh, pages. Uh, you can read here the Amen um, it's a passage from Mark 3.27, and that was assumed to be the very earliest written Germanic. Uh, this is uh, just a few words and letters, but um, it's uh, opening up uh, interesting possibilities of earlier written forms as far north as uh, uh, Norway. And um, so there comes a new layer of German in, uh, in the Germanic period. And um, they show also the kind of cultural development of that period. So, uh, they have to do with trade, uh, like the word kaufen, um, or uh, they have to do with building, uh, such as uh, pfeile, from a Latin pilarium, um, but also <laughs> uh, comfort goods like socks are uh, imported into uh, the Germanic languages. Um, and as I said, uh, the weekdays are uh, conceptualized through loan translation from um, Latin. So they uh, show an increasing organization, administration of uh, the Germanic region, which isn't really at that point subdivided into uh, languages, let alone national languages, but you have a, a spectrum of dialects that interrelate and merge. And so you have um, some dialects uh, between um, English and German closer to each other than the German dialects are close to each other. So Old Saxon and Old English are closer than Old Saxon um, and Old High German, even though both are eventually merged to become uh, German. And um, a whole group of verbs uh, falls into that category. All the verbs um, with so-called Rückumlaut, so weak verbs that have in Middle High German an Umlaut um, in the present tense and no Umlaut in the past tense are from that period derived from strong verbs. So führen, furte, um, tränken, Trankte, 
uh, senken sankte um, are all fall in this category. And you can see how um, the vocab branches out to refine actions and um, allow a wider range of expressions. So what uh, then is Deutsch? It, uh, the word Deutsch comes from a Indo-European root, toy, to, which uh, also survives in a daumen and in tausend. It means to swell or to be a multitude, to be uh, uh, proliferating. And so it's used to uh, uh, the word diet, meaning uh, the folk, uh, the uh, uh, people, is used to denote a large number of people, but it doesn't tell you anything about um, which exactly which people it is, or what language they are speaking. It's um, Deutsch as uh, adjective to diot, um, basically means uh, vernacular, anything that is not in Latin. It can also uh, mean anything that is not Latin in the sense that is barbaric, non-cultivated. We're just uh, discussing the word grob in paper three uh, translation. In a way, it's everything that is Group and not refined, <laughs> that is uh, uh, Deutsch. Uh, the um, noun diot people survives only in this adjective Deutsch and in some names. Dietrich uh, is uh, the one who is powerful over the paper and is the name of the most popular. A hero of the Middle Ages. So Siegfried only becomes really popular in the late Middle Ages, uh, the figure that captured popular imagination in the German Middle Ages was Dietrich von Bern, um, whom you encounter, for example, in the uh, oldest heroic epic in German, the Hildebrandslied. Uh, but then also in, in later Dietrich's epic, and you see him here in a manuscript from the 12th century, Verona, as Theodericus Rex. So um, Theodiscus is then a medieval Latin uh, adjective uh, that is back derived from the Germanic uh, Deutsch, Theodisk, uh, Althochdeutsch, Diotisk, Theodisk. Um, and um, so Theodiske um, means both that uh, which is in the language of the common people and that what's uh, really understandable. And actually, the earliest uh, testimony for the Middle Latin a back translation of this term comes from England. Um, anybody know where Corbridge is? It's on Hadrian's Wall, so um, 20 kilometers west of Newcastle. Um, and it's a beautiful uh, church that was built with stones from Hadrian's Wall, um, an area where you can really discuss when do, does antiquity end or when, uh, when do the Middle Ages uh, start. And um, in the 7th century, um, there was an English pope uh, in Rome, Hadrian I, um, and he uh, asked for reports from the synod held 
at the north end of the Christian um, empire uh, near the Hadrian's Wall. And he was told that the minutes of the meetings were read, tam latine quam theodisque quo omnis intellegere possunt. So they were read both in Latin and in theodisque so that everybody could um, understand it. So at that period, theodisque Deutsch uh, means the popular language, and that's also uh, preserved in one national language, which... Dutch. Uh, so uh, Dutch is basically Deutsch, uh, but um, from the perspective of uh, a scene of, of the English as uh, the popular language. And at that point, actually, uh, the language spoken in what's now the Netherlands and in North England would have been more or less mutually intelligible, uh, just grades of dialect. Um, and those who have done um, Gregorius uh, will remember the discussion in the first few lines about bedüten, sedüte sagen, uh, means both to tell something, to uh, translate something into German and to interpret, uh, to make clear something. Um, and uh, I've just given you from the Digitales uh, Wörterbuch der Deutschen Sprache, the DWDS, the explanation to, uh, on Deuten and all the uh, variations derived from it. So that's the same root as Deutsch, just with a different adjective ending. So if you speak Deutsch, you also uh, speak deutlich. And these connotations um, are retained even to the uh, current uh, day. Uh, this is an overview which you'll have seen if you've uh, written your first uh, essay on how to um, actually structure uh, the periods um, for different reasons, linguistic, functional, extra-linguistic. Um, but I mainly want to concentrate today on the geographic uh, structure uh, between Low German, Central German, and Upper German. Um, and the overarching structure that is then um, given through the standardization of language to make things um, understandable across the different uh, dialects. Um, so the pyramid of um, dialects gets uh, Small and smaller, so the more elaborate your vocab is, um, the further it's understood, but in a, a smaller segment of society. Um, this and uh, several other of the uh, maps and diagrams I've taken from the DTV Atlas zur deutschen Sprache because I always find it helpful as a kind of visualization. Uh, this is a very old one. Um, the DTV Atlas I like best is a real fun one to near Namenkunde, and that's a topic we don't really discuss in paper four, but which I might introduce in uh, future iterations of paper four, because names tell a lot of uh, stories about origin and um, cultural concepts through... Uh, uh, the period. Um, so, um, in the Middle High German, we had been looking at the Indo European strong verbs, then the weak verbs derived from strong verbs in the 
uh, a Germanic period, and um, then you have a, 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 a consistent um, addition to the vocabulary in throughout the Old High German and Middle High German uh, period. I've jumped across Old High German because we'll learn more about that in the last session with Aletta Leipold. Um, and I've just pointed out a few words that come in um, in the late 12th century, mainly from French as the fashionable language of um, the day. For example, all weak verbs that have the ending ihren or ellen. Um, uh, as I mentioned, so to ride is a very old concept, but galoppieren is then something that only is possible once you have uh, the fully rigged up horse with a uh, saddle, stirrups, and uh, so on. Um, you have uh, words like fädeln uh, from faden. Einfädeln is to uh, thread a needle. And um, that um, you have the introduction of the button. A very uh, knopf is a, a, a new word which is an exciting moment for fashion because it means you can tailor uh, the, uh, your dresses to the figure rather than having it uh, in a way that you can <coughs> pull it over your head. Um, and you have um, also lots of uh, cultural vocabulary from Latin coming in via medieval French. For example, all the um, specific terms for poetry, like rhyme. Um, and um, this period is interesting, again, to compare. If you look up the same words in the uh, OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, and the, in the Middle High German Dictionary, you will come to a lot of the same um, imported words like uh, tournament, uh, galop, uh, and so on. But typically, in England, the words were introduced a century earlier than uh, into German, which means they undergo a slightly different process. Um, it's worthwhile, actually, if you are looking up Middle High German words, also to look at the OED sometimes, because they will always give uh, related words in German if the same concept exists uh, in English. Um, I'll finish uh, in the last 10 minutes by looking at uh, then the connotations uh, that Deutsch, Teutsch, uh, acquires throughout the medieval period to modern uh, German concept, what is Deutsch. And um, a key figure here for defining what is Deutsch is Walter von der Vogelweide in his Preislied. Um, he defines Tüch to be a habit, a form of uh, behavior, living, um, and praises it. So not um, German as a national concept, but uh, as a kind of aspiration of um, good living. And um, so he praises his own art of singing by praising his audience as being examples of uh, embodiment of good Germanness. 
Ihr sollt sprechen, Wille kommen, der ü Meere bringet, das bin ich. Alles, das ihr habt vernommen, das ist gar ein Wind, nu fraget mich. Ich will aber mirte, wird mein Lohn nicht gut, ich gesage ü Lichte, das ü Sanfte tuert. Secht, was man mir ehren bierte. Ich will tüschen Frauen sagen, solche Meere, dass sie deste Bass all der Werte sullen behagen. Ahne große Mirte tue ich das. Was wollt ich zu lohne? Sie sind mir zu her, so bin ich's gefürge und bitte sie nicht des mehr, weil dass sie mich größen schone. Ich ha ein Lande viel gesehen und nahm der Besten gerne wahr. Übel müsse mir geschehen, kunde ich ihr mein Herz bringen da, dass ihm wohl gefallen wollte fremme der Sitte. Nu, was rülfe mich, ob ich Unrecht des Dritte, Tüschü Zucht gart vor ihn allen. Ähm, Margarita Kuhn translates it as deutsche Lebensart. So he uh, is defining German as a, a way of uh, living that can be found across a wide area, which he isn't defining really, again, as a national bounder, but as something that encompasses a certain way of speaking and uh, living. Von der Elbe uns an den Rhin und Herr wieder uns an Ungarland, mugen wohl die Besten sehen, die ich in der Welt Hahn erkannt, kann ich rechte schauen, gurt, gelas und lieb, se mir Gott, so swür ich wohl, dass hier die Wieb besser sind, dann a ander Frauen. Tüsche Mann sind wollgezogen, Recht als Engel sind die Wieb getan, es wär sie schildet, der's betrocken, ich entkann sie anders nicht verstahn, tuckend und reine Minne, es wär dir suchen will, der soll kommen in unser Land, da ist Wünnefil, lange mürs ich leben der Inne. And then the last verse reveals that it's all just a chat up line, uh, where uh, he is uh, praising uh, these wonderful German speaking women just to impress this one lady but who isn't interested in him. Uh, but, um, so this double definition of uh, German as a way of living and a way of speaking, of writing poetry uh, is uh, the kind of um, uh, Ariadne thread running through uh, the centuries. Um, I've given you the definition of Teusch, Teusch, in the Große Vollständige Universallexikon aller Wissenschaften und Künste, the largest dictionary project of the 18th century, uh, printed in Halle uh, in the uh, mid uh, 18th century. And um, that has uh, 50 columns defining uh, Teutsch as um, the people who are uh, particularly um, heroic and um, brilliant, but um, then goes on to mainly concentrate on Teutsche Dichtkunst, Teutsche Poesie oder Poeterei. Uh, wird allgemein insgemein in drei Absätze oder Zeiten eingeteilt, in die Uralte, deren Tacitus gedenkt, in die Mittelste, die sich von Karl dem Großen anfängt, und in die Neueste, welche vom 17. Jahrhundert angeht. So you have a, a different kind of structuring of, of history and poetry. Um, and um, in a similar way, even half a century later, Johann Christoph uh, Adelung in the Grammatisch-Kritisches Wörterbuch der Hochdeutschen Mundart um, says, uh, in generally speaking, Deutsch means um, uh, den Deutschen gemäß oder eigen, uh, but the first uh, and foremost point is the German language. Um, and the kind of collocations he uses here are, ich will es dir in Deutsch sagen, ohne Umschweife, offenherzig, so uh, Deutsch gets uh, 
the connotation of being the honest, open, um, proper way of uh, speaking. Um, uh, this becomes a kind of uh, comic turn in uh, Johann Wilhelm Ludwig Gleim's um, Gedichte nach Walter von der Vogelweide, who updates the price lead that we've uh, just seen um, into a, a really uh, unfreiwillig komisch uh, praise of der deutsche Mann. Zu sein ist Ehre, Gott lob, ich bin ein deutscher Mann. Ich grämte mich, wenn ich's nicht wäre, sehr neidisch deutsche Männer an. Der deutsche Mann bringt seine Seele wie Löw und Lux in eine Höhle vor Forschern und Belauschern nicht. Er trägt sie offen im Gesicht. So, Deutsch ist um, uh, associated uh, uh, with uh, openness, honesty, uh, again, a way of uh, living rather than a nationality. And I um, was quite shocked when I looked uh, this morning in my poesie album. I, I don't know whether any of you know what a poesie album is. Um, it, it was popular um, in uh, Germany in my generation and the generation before to have a, a booklet in which all your friends would write um, little poems. And it goes back to a tradition of Album Amicorum, Stammbücher, uh, which were uh, used by students in the 18th century, where uh, uh, they used like a kind of LinkedIn, where you, uh, you would ask all your friends to write in a uh, motto and uh, uh, color something. And... Um, We would look up uh, old booklets of poetry to uh, put it in. And uh, here one of my classmates uh, written in um, something about Das Deutsche Kind, which certainly goes back to national socialist notions of uh, Deutschness. Du deutsches Kind, sei tapfer, treu und wahr. Lass nie die Lüge dein Mund entweihen. Von Alters her im deutschen Volke war der höchste Ruhm, getreu und wahr zu sein. So, um, these are variations of uh, associations of Deutsch still surviving into the 1970s when I was in uh, year three and had uh, uh, this uh, booklet. Um, it's worthwhile looking through uh, dictionaries, and I can recommend for anybody um, doing essays to uh, compare also the two versions of the Deutsches Wörterbuch by the brothers uh, Grimm, uh, because uh, the Neue Grimm is by now uh, just advanced beyond D. Uh, I think they are now at G. Um, and you can really study how it was kind of denationalized and toned down the language of uh, what constitutes uh, Germanness. Um, so uh, my last slide is uh, then. Um, Hoffmann von Faller's Lebens um, translation of um, Walter's Price Lied uh, with a, a kind of uh, fatal uh, insistence of a repetition of uh, Deutsch, uh, which, when read in its historic context, is very clear that is this is before. Uh, the national unity of Germany. So Hoffmann von Faller's Leben is writing in a continuum of reading German as a cultural concept and a language uh, concept. So um, the Deutsche Sang. 
but also as a kind of um, ideal to be aspired to in terms of um, uh, uh, character um, um, uh, traits, um, which can then be misread in a situation after the German national unification when Deutschland, Deutschland über alles uh, it's a pretty broken, <laughs> well, a, a really ghastly uh, 1970s uh, uh, cover. Um, but uh, it's worthwhile kind of stepping back, and uh, that's why it's so important to study actually historical linguistics to be, uh, to be able to unpick uh, the meaning of words in every period of the German language. All right, uh, next week um, we'll be looking at um, dialects um, and code mixing, also looking at language purism. But what I didn't uh, really explain is my cover image, which is taken from one of my favorite Austrian artists, um, Paul Flora, who tried to show in his comic strips um, uh, linguistic concepts. And so he has shown in this how Sprache can be used. And it can be misused uh, to uh, overpower somebody uh, uh, like here to conquer the language, but it can also be used, and um, uh, that's what we are going to try to do to uh, reach for a higher understanding to uh, 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 reach out to the stars. Thank you. Thank you.